In addition to thinking about the relationship between food and the brain, it's also important to think about the relationship between stone tools and the brain. Stone tools have always been an important part of the model for human evolution. Going back to the time of Darwin, and all the way through Philip Tobias's model for the origin of the genus Homo in the form of Homo habilis, handyman associated with the production of stone tools. In thinking about the relationship between stone tools and the brain, it's important again to think about this interrelationship between the two. Which came first, a large brain that provided the cognitive capacity necessary to produce stone tools, or stone tools which selected for greater cognitive capacity in terms of allowing for better diet and actually another selective element necessary to create larger brains? And again, it's necessary to think about the interrelationship of the two. Which came first in the context of the fossil and archaeological records, and how do they relate to one another? Again, stone tools represent a fundamental transformation in how hominins would have existed within their environment, and how they would have viewed elements within that environment. We know that Australopithecines were probably engaged in some form of tool use. We've already talked about that in the context of the South African Australopithecines and the bone tools they may have used for digging or termiting. We've also talked about the fact that primates use tools. For example, chimpanzees use different kinds of twigs, selectively chosen and manipulated, to engage in termite fishing. But when you think about hominins developing stone tools, we're beginning to see an amplification of those behaviors, something a little bit more complex. Suddenly, in the context of the Oldowan, this stone tool becomes something that's not just a rock, but something with specific material properties. It has a grain structure that's either fine or coarse, which dictates how well it can fracture, how well it can hold a cutting surface. And already in the old one, we see selective utilization of better quality rocks for the production of stone tools, the manipulation of those rocks, potentially even the storing of those rocks in the landscape that all reflect cultural and cognitive change in terms of how individuals are seeing the environment around them. Suddenly the environment becomes something to be utilized, exploited, to take advantage of third party resources, like a carcass to be butchered. So already in the old one, we see high evidence of complex behaviors related to the manipulation of stone tools. And again, the question is which comes first, the brain or the tools themselves? In the context of our current understanding of the archaeological record, stone tools appear to predate any kind of major encephalization. We begin seeing evidence for butchery of animals going back at least two and a half million years, possibly quite a bit earlier than that. And given that Australopithecines also were likely tool users, if not stone tool users, and that apes are also tool users, it's likely that tool use developed piecemeal, but reaching perhaps a critical threshold in the context of early Homo, when we begin seeing selective utilization of particular stone elements creating a durable material culture in the form of stone tools, one that will eventually develop even increased complexity as we begin to get stylistic differences between regional utilization of stone tools. But it's clear that stone tools are critical to the development of the brain in humans and probably predated the development of larger brains with the origin of Homo.